That's it. I think that's a really good point. That's not the one I was trying to make, but I really like that point. Uh, I really do because uh, it's, I think you're right. There's an assumption that um, joy needs to be, or, or sorrow needs to be erased when there are times when it just needs to be borne out. Um, there, are, there are sorrowful things, and we don't want to underestimate the power of positive grieving, if that's a, if that's a thought. Uh, not, in, not in a self-loathing way, not in a way that is destructive, but there are times, and, and the Scripture reinforces this idea, there are times when it's better to bear the grief and to go through that process because you come out more complete. We need to allow ourselves to grieve, and we need to allow others to grieve, to Michaela's point. I think that's an excellent observation. Now, what was I trying to say? Does anyone You're, else think that? Greg, I think, are you trying to say someone's, someone's in sorrow and you're looking at them and saying, oh, what are you grieving about that for? You know, that's not that, I wouldn't be grieving because of that or that's not that difficult of a situation um, or in the opposite, rejoicing. Uh, what, is that really something to be? Okay. I think I know what you're saying. Harry's got something she wants to share. Um, judging others for what it is they get sorrowful about or what they're joyful about, maybe? Uh, something I think you'd want to avoid. Yes, ma'am. Well, um, if someone is in sorrow, because I see this a lot in my, my line of work, um, I can say, I've been there. I've done this. We can, we can get through it together. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of encouragement and love that needs to happen, especially when someone is a prickly cactus when you you meet them. And, you know, pr cactuses are prickly. They're hard to hug. But eventually you can, I, my philosophy is that love will help. Love gets you through. So if you can encourage one another, and at least that person in sin, saying, hey, that was me you know, so many years ago, and I got through it, and I'm a better person for it. Yes, the past is a thing that is very hard to live through and forget because it, it always pops up in your face, mm -hmm. but we can get through it. And if you fill your life with a lot of the positive stuff, positive Christians, positive interactions, sin will get pushed out. You mentioned in your work and in, in regards to, uh, I forgot the number, verse 16, whatever it is, um, associate with the lowly. Do you, do you think your work brings you in contact with the lowly, people in a low state? Yes, yes, most definitely, because these are people who have lost everything to abuse, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, and they're... They come to me naked. They don't have clothes. So um, the first thing I do, especially if they don't want to be there, is offer them something to drink and start building them back up. Now, I'm with these people, these individuals. I don't know. I want to touch their lives. I want to give them positiveness. Um, so the first thing they need to to know is I'm not going to judge them. I'm not going to be mean to you. I'm not going to uh, throw things in your face. Yes, we know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. You know, so yeah. let's, you know, let's start it out with some good positive interaction. Excellent. And who it is, who it is we choose to get uh, intimated with is is to our hurt when when those who are naked and stripped bare um it's a challenge to us to associate with the lowly and you do a good work in what you do but it's also um, a broader sense i think when we when we weep with those who weep we kind of want to weep with those who are crying over well you know my granddaughter lost the ball game last night that's, that's, I don't think that's what this is talking about. 
And it's talking about people who have true, deep sorrow and people who have joy. And we, we want to sort of filter out, we won't want the hard cases, right? We don't want the difficult relationships. There have been people of the church before, and Alice and I have talked about this, and you look at this person and they're kind of a, they're kind of a pain. It's just like they can't sort of get their act together and they're kind of making trouble all the time and they're always needing something. And you go, what is that person bringing to the church? And we've concluded what they're bringing to the church is an opportunity to serve them. And we need to see it that way. And it's, it's a challenge for us to say, let's just be honest, we want... We want a church building full of people who look like us, who at least have around the same income level as us, who have about the same level of achievements as we do, and we end up kind of all looking alike because we don't want to associate with the lowly. You know, and there are a lot of people in Columbus that could use the good news, and I'm afraid sometimes modern American churches are more concerned about their image and who it is they associate with than finding to associate with the lowly. Yeah. I don't know where, whether this is a place to bring this one up, but where do we bear, uh, bear one another's burdens when it comes to consequences of sin? I think, you know, I don't want to mitigate the consequences when somebody needs to have some suffering to, you know, prick their heart, if you would, you mm-hmm. know, because godly sorrow it produces repentance. So we want we want them to yes, we want to help them maybe sorrow with them, but where do we where are we on bearing one another's burdens when it comes to consequences of sin? Because I don't we want it there needs to be some pain there. I don't mean it want to sound bad, but there needs to be some consequences that you know, there's some suffering there and we can be there to help them in the, that but you know, I think that's you know, too often I've seen, you know, parents will, they'll mitigate that consequence to the point where the kid doesn't even, you know, really have any suffering of what they did was wrong to the point where they don't learn the lessons that we need to learn from uh, the consequences that come from our our own failures. Okay. Okay. Dan's deviated from the thought a little bit. He admits that, and I'm going to permit it because we're talking about bearing one of those burdens. And I think that's a really interesting thought that he's uh, brought to us. So y'all need to help Dan with an answer or answers to that. Uh, What happens, how do we, how do we catch ourselves or how do we know what level of uh, coming alongside is too much? Is that the thought? What part of the burden do we pick up and bear? Okay. How much, how much do we let the person who has to suffer the consequences of their actions bear those consequences themselves as a learning exercise uh, as opposed to how much can we lift off of that individual? I think that's an interesting question. I've got some maybe to have been there or been subject to it. I don't know which yet. Either one. Um, I think restoration should make it so that it ha- have, if they've not repented and if they're still living in that sin, then that pain needs to be felt. But once the, once the forgiveness comes, once the restoration comes, I think that that's when the burden needs to be relieved and needs to be shared with others. Okay, I think that's a great turning point. And it's, it's a recognition that we're looking for a changed heart first before we start looking to take away the cause of the pain. Yeah, I, I totally agree that, you know, we're not, we're not tasked with being the ones to dole out the pain when it comes to suffering because of someone's sin. Right. Um, that's, that's God's role. The only time when we, hopefully I don't, speak too soon here. I haven't thought all of this through, but, you know, I gave a lesson recently about church discipline. And the only time when the church's role is to let, you know, 
let them sit in in the problems that they've made for themselves is 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 like she said when there's when there's a lack of repentance and when there's a risk to the church that person isn't leaving the body they still see themselves as part of the body and they're doing harm within the body because of their defiance and their unrepentance i i see that as the only time when we when we don't step in and try to alleviate that pressure because at that point the command is there needs to be that pressure for that person to be removed um, for the sake of them but also for the sake of everyone else in the body um, that no further harm's done once that happens um, there's we have no role laid on us to keep kicking them or to keep increasing the pain um, that's that's God's domain I, I agree if this if there is true repentance there's going to be godly sorrow with that and I think godly sorrow is is in a sense a mixture of regret and shame and and other feelings of boy I really need to I really need to watch myself. I'm going to try to do better next time. And if a person's already kind of kicking themselves like that, I mean, some of us are really more critical of ourselves than we are anyone else in the room. And some of us suffer from uh, being our own worst critic. And if we're making it bad enough, for, we don't need other people piling on to make us feel even worse because that just, that just turns around and... Uh, uh, magnifies the pain because we think it's justified. We think we deserved it. Joyce. Um, I love Joy. the comments that have been made. Um, <clears throat> I would say uh, the things that I wrote down were it would take wisdom and experience and maybe trying to um, feed into what their motive is. Is their motive to get out of consequences or is their motive to be right with God, and do what's right. Um, <clears throat> but like you mentioned, there are some that um, sink to the point of the loss of their soul over it. Um, and so, you know, the way we, I, I really like the way Harriet said, um, she acknowledges it, we know what you're doing, and let's, you know, move on from here. Um, I, I had heard a um, comment one time, uh, said to someone who was absolutely at the bottom, you've made your bed, now you have to lie in it. When that person didn't know that there was a bed in the room, so that was zero help. Um, uh, so I think that um, yeah, it does take wisdom and experience and maybe trying to figure out, you know, what their motive is if they're still trying to um, get by with it or if they're taking responsibility for it. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's been uh, signs of repentance, uh, which is something we can look for. Um, we don't want to put ourselves in the role of judging the sincerity of that repentance. We can look at the fruits of repentance, but let's not get too far ahead in saying, I just wonder how serious they were about this. And, you know, when a person when a person is caught up in sin, the first time you ask God to forgive you is probably not the last time you ask God to forgive you for that particular sin. And there will be relapses. There will be turning back to the same thing that you have been engaged in. I mean, if this, is a, if this has become a habit or habitual behavior, um, and then God also talks about how many times you forgive someone who is really trying to make a change. And it, it may seem like that's going soft to some of us. It may seem like, well, how are we really going to know if, you know, if they really repented? And um, We have to leave some of this in the judgment of God. Our duty is to take care of one another as we're enduring these things. It's not to be the final judge of a person's sincerity of character. That's not our role. But let's not slip into that either. Yes, ma'am. Throw a question out here based on this. Um, so how do how does a person know if some and again this might go back to what you were saying about not judging people, which I understand that. Um, but how do you know if someone is sorry because of the actual sin they committed or if they're just sorry because of the consequences? Yeah. How do you That's, know? I don't know. Samantha doesn't know. <laughs> Does anyone else know? Who's got that? Who's got that barometer that they can tell the difference? 
I think it's a great question of yourself. How often is it your godly sorrow, and how often if it's, it's a sorrow in, a, in terms of a human sorrow? Chuck, back in the corner. A couple things about this. Samantha's question is a very interesting question. And sometimes you can work with any sorrow. So if you're sorry because you got caught, you've got something to work with. Mm-hmm. Because we can use, you can use that level of sorrow and build upon it and teach. And someone can come to the realization you know, that this was really deeper uh, the initial sorrow is is okay. I mean, a lot of times, the, the consequences of what drives that initial sorrow a lot of times. But then it, it, we can build on that and go deeper. So I, you can work with either one, and I don't think, just like I think you said, it's not our job to judge or level sorrow. It's my job to meet you where you're at and encourage you and help you to understand, you know, the ramifications of where you're going. It, it's It's almost like when somebody is, interested in christianity we'll meet you where you're at and then we'll teach you further and further um that's that's kind of the the challenge when somebody does get caught <clears throat> back to a little bit of what dan said the the parent that works and works and works that gate any consequences you know that's not a we need to embrace consequences jim atkins told me years and years and years ago mistakes are a great teacher just don't get all your learning from there. And over the years, and I remember a lot of these now older and some passed on guys that when I had troubles and challenges, you know, in business and life and spirituality, they, they, none of them said, well, let's see if we can make this go away. There, it was always, well, what did we learn? What are we going to do to make this better? And how are we going to grow from this? Uh, there's a great book called Necessary Endings. And one of the chapters in the book is I'm never going back. And sometimes in life we have to have either such deep regret or such deep consequences that we draw a line in the sand and say, I'm never going back there because it was painful and I hated it. And sometimes that teaches us some great lessons. So I remember making comments about my own father. And, you know, some of you have mentioned your level of intimidation from Bill Walker. And I can remember thinking, just beat me and leave me alone. I don't want to go through listening to what you've got to say. Uh, And it was about recognizing those consequences. But uh, the, the, the idea that that just because our sorrow isn't a deep uh, need to draw closer to God doesn't mean there's not a means by which to get there by using what you have and taking, if it's just shame, if it's just the shame of being caught, don't forget, there are people who are shameless in their sin and the Bible says they will have no shame. You don't have anything to work with in that, in that kind of scenario. Because they're not scared of God and they're not, they're not scared of the consequences from the people they know or from society. You're left with, it's really hard to get them to see, to move towards changing their life. So uh, I think those are good observations. Um, just to answer Samantha's question, this might be really, really simple, uh, but sorry, to use a Disney reference. Um, in Frozen 2, Anna says, I'm going to just do the next right thing. So I, I think just a basic answer is, what do they do next? Are they doing something? Are, doing, are they doing the next right thing? Or are they, their next step is a step backwards, so. Okay. We'll borrow from Disney. See, my girls are all older, so I don't know anything about Frozen. I know Disney princesses that are older than that. She's a good one, you said. All right, I'll have to learn that one. All right, it's been a good conversation on this topic. I appreciate it. Anything else you want to throw in? Again, I think, I think these are some of the, really, the, the, the greatest uh, responsibilities within the church and some of the greatest challenges for us to 
know how to come alongside side someone who is sorrowful in sin and, and do and say the right thing. And it, it, it could be very incremental. It could be very quick, like one of those moments that just changes your whole life. But whatever it is, we've got to work through it. Yes. I just have a question about how do we not keep ourselves so buttoned up about other people's sorrow? Because I, th I look around and think, I feel like there are cultures that embrace communal sorrow better than ours does. Um, I think that, is it an aversion? We're afraid that, oh, we're going to conjure up difficult feelings or we're going we're gonna to make them relive it all over again if we ask them how they're feeling or if we ask them how it's going. Mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we weep with those who weep more effortlessly? And why is it so hard? Why is it so hard? So we do, I'll, I'll make some general cultural observations. We do live in a culture that values strength in, um, in oneness. There is this idea that each one of us needs to be a strong island of uh, some kind of fortress. And if you're going to build a fortress in that manner, you've got to keep everything out. You've got to keep out the good and the bad. Um, I think, too, culture has looked at leadership and said vulnerability is out. Any sign of, of sorrow or weakness or regret is out. You just move forward. You run over your enemies and you keep going. Uh, and I think those are, those are the kind of things that poison us as, as how we view, um, to Michaela's first point, embracing sorrow when it needs to be embraced. Um, we may not have a good, healthy understanding of what is good sorrow and what is bad sorrow. Self-loathing is not a good place to be. And for all that we say we don't want to acknowledge and, and treat community sorrow, the, the statisticians will tell us that the suicide rates in this country are one of the highest in all of the developed world. And most of it is people have self-loathing. And they don't, they're, they're alone. They don't know where to turn. We are a sick culture in terms of our inability to express ourselves in constructive ways, in particular when it's a call for help. And, and you and I, if we're not the one calling for help, we do need to be more astute to what does that look like in another person. We're probably going to have Harriet teach us a class on this. You know, about what do you look for and what do you see and how do you, how do you perceive people so that you don't let them get in that state of sorrow that is, that is self, self-destructive. Um, but, I mean, I can also just observe we have a very sick culture because God has been put out of our place of prominence in our culture. And that's a very generic answer. It's very true. But, but I think those are the kind of ramifications we also see from the fact that God is not a, a topic of, of open conversation in our, in our culture. You have the mic? Go ahead. I think Andrew, in asking the question, hit on one of the reasons why we don't, and that is because we're, we're afraid of either saying the wrong thing or of adding to their sorrow. And the problem with that is we can't know what they're feeling at the, at the moment. Maybe it's a, a good time to share what we want to share. Maybe it's not. But what they need to know more than anything else is that they're, they're, not, they're not alone in what they're going through. And I think that's the most helpful thing we can do. And, and get over feeling like we have to have the right things to say and uh, know exactly the right moment to say it because... <clears throat> I, I don't know about you, but I'm not that perfect. Um, and so, you know, if I share something with someone who's having a difficult time, and this happened to be a really bad moment to share it, <clears throat> I can just say, I, I can see that th this was th this was a really not not maybe not the best time to, for me to, to to share this with you, but I just wanted you to know that you weren't alone. And and I, I think. I think when we have the relationship that we need to have with each other, 
we understand that even even when things are not necessarily said in the the perfect way or at the perfect moment we appreciate the person who's coming alongside us for what they were trying to do and what they're trying to help us through and i mean sometimes the best thing we can do is just be a sounding board and just be with them so that they can share what they're feeling and and uh, we may not have any there may not be anything we can do at the moment or anything we can say but us being there is is helpful and if there are things that we're feeling about it i mean don't over <laughs> focus on yourself but i think it's helpful for them to know we're hurting too <clears throat> not in the same way um not to the same degree that they are but but we we remember this person and we we feel something uh in the loss and so it's helpful for them to know they're not alone in what they're going through and i think sometimes that's the most important thing we can do and and get get over thinking Oh, I might say the wrong thing. You will. You will say the wrong thing. At I some point, do. you will say something, and you will feel like, oh, why did I open my mouth so wide and stick my foot in it so far? Yeah. Okay, acknowledge it. I, I'm sorry that that was not the best thing for me to say. I just, I, 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 I want to help you, and I, I just, I, I don't always know the best way to do that. So, and I, I've, I've told people. I told my neighbor, I said, if there's a time we're talking and I'm running my mouth and you just need me to shut up, you're not going to hurt my feelings if you tell me it, you just need to stop. Yeah. So, I mean, because we want to help, but sometimes we we get ahead of ourselves and and get caught up in the moment and we do or say things that are, while maybe true, are not helpful. You know, those who are spiritual will store such a one in a spirit of meekness. It doesn't mean they have all the answers either. And spiritual-minded people can be pretty simple-minded people as well and just not necessarily think through what to say sometimes. Um, but we, we've noted already a lot of times it's, it's a lot more about the notion that you're not alone, that other people care about you, and that other people hurt when you hurt. I'm going to tell a story on Andrew, Allison. Uh, as, as he got older in his schooling, and all the kids did this, they all did this, they was more self-directed, and he was, he was doing some trigonometry, I can't even say the word, or, or algebra or something, and he comes to mom and says, Mom, I got this problem, this, this problem in math, and, and, and I need you to help me with this, and she said, okay, and he starts going through it, and she's going, after about 30 seconds, he's like way over my head. I don't even know where we are. And, but he keeps talking. Well, man, if I do this, I could do this. And, and then he gets done with all and he says, well, oh, thanks, Mom, for helping me out so much. And he goes back to work on the problem. And Allison's like, what did I do? You know, I just sat there while I was confused while he talked about his problem. And he talked himself through it. And, and sometimes that's what we need. I mean, I like wisdom, too. If you got it, you know, bring it on. But if all you can do is sit there and nod, then, then sit there and nod. Then do that, because it's not getting done. It's not being done. We have to care enough about one another to sit and listen. And it just, I think that's, it all starts there. And from there, you build on, if you've got something to contribute, contribute. But it's got to start there. It has to. Carry it back over here. Three mics in one class lesson. I'm going to have to start restricting you. Where's Chuck? Oh, he's up here. I'm sorry. Joy. <clears throat> so I would just like to quickly um, point out that uh, when it was said, why is it so hard that there is a spectrum and that there are people that feel everything, are up all night in pain, when you hurt, they hurt in the pit of their stomach. They feel like puking two blocks from the funeral home every time. And I just, I think that is abnormal, but it does happen. We have to, uh, we have to be of sound mind in order to do this work. That's, that's all I can say to that. It, it is challenging work. It's challenging. Um. 
with individuals who are on the brink of doing something, letting them know there's a safety net. C call a friend. You know, text somebody. Yeah. Um, if you feel tempted, tested, whatever, call somebody. It's not hard. And having those safety nets are so important. And just sitting there and holding their hand, that could be like the best thing ever. I've done that a lot. It's it's okay. It's okay. I'm, you know, phone a friend. Um, some some males in America are taught to repel from a kind touch, you know. Uh, maybe females too, but it's more of a man thing. And, um, you know, it, it's okay to accept the sympathy of others, from others. And we've got to allow ourselves to do that. It's soothing and it's encouraging. And if they're not right there in the room, then reach out and call someone so they can soothe you with their voice. Uh, and these things are critical. I mean, the mental health people are saying one out of four teens has ideation these days. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can ask me later. It's, it's like one out of four. Or maybe one out of three. It's, it's, a, it's an unbelievable number of those who are between 14 and 19 or 20 or something who have ideation of, of self-harm. So I appreciate all the thoughts and comments from, from the professionals and the amateurs in the room. My gratitude to all of you. And we, we did not advance as far as I thought we might today, but that's okay. We'll probably talk about this the next one, sorrow and sickness and, and difficulty as we move forward. Thank you.